people have started to warn us that if we carry on as we are with climate change, we're in danger of destroying our civilization. But no one ever explains to you what the end of civilization will be like, what will cause it, when will it happen. So I'm making some videos about it. I've already made one video where I looked at four different ways climate change might damage or even destroy our civilization. And now in this video, I'm going to look to the future decade by decade, temperature rise by temperature rise, and try and understand how it's going to happen. I had, I had some comments against the first video I made along the lines of, I'm being too pessimistic. But I'm not the person who's saying civilization is going to collapse. I'm trying to understand what it would be like if it did. The people who are warning that civilization is in danger of collapse include people who work for the British government in quite senior positions. Here's Here's an extract from a speech by Sir James Bevan, who is in charge of the Environment Agency. He says, much higher sea levels will take out most of the world's cities, displace millions, and make much of the rest of the land surface uninhabitable or unusable. Much more extreme weather will kill more people through drought, flooding, wildfires, and heat waves than most wars have. The net effect will collapse ecosystems, slash crop yields, take out the infrastructure that our civilization depends on, and destroy the basis of our modern economy and modern society. In this video, because I'm looking forwards, I'm going to be much more reliant on the climate science from the United Nations and also from someone called Dr Peter Carter, who's an expert reviewer for the United Nations reports, and also a book by Joseph Tainter called The Collapse of Complex Societies. Okay, so he's the respected expert in how civilizations collapse. If you haven't got time to watch the whole video, I can sum it up quite well by this excerpt from a, a British television news programme, if I can find it, and it's, it's given by the weather presenter, but everything she says is fully in line with um, the United Nations forecasts. So let's see if I can find that. We're talking about India, 1.5 billion people in a heat wave. The temperatures they're having there, 50 degrees Celsius, normally happen just for a couple of weeks in the middle of summer. People have no water, they don't have energy to stay cool. It's devastated 50% of crops in some areas, which will affect food prices all around the world. And in the UK, we could in the next 20 years have 40 degrees Celsius. We've never reached that, and we will see similar things. We'll run out of water, we'll run out of energy, and it'll affect our crops. She was talking about Britain in particular. I'm guessing if you're one of the 100 million people in the United States who was warned to stay at home during the daytime recently because of the extreme heat, it's quite possible 20 years time you'll be in the same boat. No water, no energy and no food. I'm standing here, this behind me are Tilbury Docks which is London's container port and I'm here because Alan de Bottom wrote quite a good summary of our civilization. So I think it's a good way of summing up what's at risk. Here he's talking about a ship that sailed around the world, it arrives at Tilbury Docks and uses it as an example of how global our civilization is. The Goddess of the Seas docks at Tilbury Container Terminal just after 11. Given the trial she has undergone, she might have expected to be met by a minor dignitary. Three weeks earlier, she set off from Yokohama and since then she has called at Yokochi, Shenzhen, Kolkata, Istanbul, Casablanca and Rotterdam. And then he goes on to explain how complex and specialised it is. Numerous factories are situated on the very bank of the river, close enough to scoop or suck raw materials directly from the holds of ships, and are at work producing some of the less celebrated ingredients behind the smooth functioning of our utilitarian civilization. And you can only have a global, specialised, complex civilization if you have long-term financial stability to, to enable that to grow and to support it. It seems natural to admire the patience and nerves of those who put up the money to build these limbs of industry. For example, the $250 million required merely to dip the keel of a trans-Pacific container ship into the water. The investors know their outlay is in truth a form of prudence and less dangerous than leaving the money under the bed. Well, it all sounds very good, but have you noticed there's a problem with our civilization and it's nothing to do with climate change? Have you noticed if one country has a problem, it quickly spreads throughout the rest of the world. So, for example, the subprime mortgage scandal, uh, COVID, the war in Ukraine. A single war has caused a loss of a single grain uh, harvest from one country, admittedly a very important country, but it's caused an increase in wheat prices, increase in natural gas costs, 
uh, nitrogen based fertilizer which is manufactured using natural gas the production of that has stopped in a lot of places because it's no longer financially uh, viable combine that with all of the wheat producing parts of the world suffering their worst drought for 20 years you've got the Bank of England warning about um, apocalyptic increases in prices and the banks around the world are getting ready for civil disorder Sara Menka who's an expert in uh, food supply recently addressed the United Nations Security Council and this is what she said she said we've got the lowest grain inventory levels the world has ever seen it's caused logistical bottlenecks ships have you noticed anything in the world at the moment that isn't business as usual causes logistical bottlenecks and then she goes on to say it will severely impact global food security and inflation for the next three to five years at a minimum so one one event in the world can cause disruption all the way around the world in this case possibly for five years or longer the united nations knows what the problem is if the components of a system are all highly and tightly interconnected the system is in a critical state in which small interventions can lead to large system-wide changes cascading effects and system collapse in an increasingly interconnected and complex world where the risks face are compounding and cascading the dominant approach to risk management is no longer fit for purpose <music>
parts of Africa we're reaching uh, an increase in temperature of six degrees Celsius so then that really will be where well, it must be an uninhabitable I would have thought so 2030 700 million refugees in Africa alone due to the climate change that would leave 500 million people living in Africa well it's unlikely that 500 million could support the other 700 million certainly they wouldn't be allowed into Europe Europe wouldn't let 7 million African refugees in let alone 700 million there is the World Food Programme a time when it become more difficult to grow food and even if there was enough food to feed 700 million people it's not much of a life is it sitting in a tent waiting for the year to come when the world is no longer able to supply food parts of India are becoming right at the very limit of what's survivable for human at the hottest time of the year by the time we get to 2030 it's quite possible we'll reach 1.5 degrees celsius of warming that will double the heat stress of people living in India and by 2040 we could be at 2 degrees celsius of warming and that would be enough to cause the Indian economy to collapse one of India's fastest growing cities is Delhi 30 million people live there one of the reasons it's growing so fast is because a lot of men are leaving their homes behind because of drought and extreme heat make it very difficult to grow crops they're coming to Delhi to look for work at the moment Delhi's water supply is already in a critical state as Delhi expands its fragile water system is on the brink of collapse the city is heavily dependent on the water received from upstream neighboring states which can lead to political tensions particularly in the hottest dry season when supply regularly falls short so that's an example of as there's less water it will, it will increase the chance of conflict in the last two years there have been over 200 conflicts due to water Delhi is also experiencing extreme heat waves unlike Africa which is a simple civilization or simple society where sadly people will die if there's not enough food and the population will decline to match the environment that can support them 30 million people if they run out of water they're all reliant on each other it's a complex society and academics are concerned when a complex society has problems like this it can collapse very quickly so when you when people ask what will the end of civilization be like and I make this video on YouTube by 2040 you won't need to watch videos about it anymore it will be in the news and remember as the climate warms India is at risk of extreme heat waves that can kill hundreds of thousands possibly millions of people within a few hours I'm guessing that by 2030 if we've seen 700 million refugees in Africa if we've seen possibly hundreds of thousands or millions of people dying within a few hours of India if we've seen Delhi or other cities collapse due to water shortages and extreme heat I'm being positive I'm hoping that by 2030 eight years time the people of the world will be so concerned about climate change they will demand their governments do something about it and for the first time the world's governments will start, start taking climate change seriously now we're on to decade 2030 to 2040 1.5 degrees celsius for warming we could be up to 2 degrees celsius of warming by 2040 if the world's governments are going to take climate change seriously they need to put their countries on a war footing because there'll be so much to do and so little time to do it but it's only when you come to do that that you realize your plans on paper which might look good on paper have problems when you put them into practice so for example in Britain there are over 20 million homes it's been estimated that it will cost between about 20 and 30 thousand pounds to upgrade each house to have it better insulation and to change its, its method of heating from gas central heating possibly to air source heat pumps and you must do it to a very high quality because it's going to cost billions of pounds you can only afford to do it once in Britain there's a great shortage of builders at the moment certainly not enough people to do it to a high quality if everyone in the world is upgrading their houses there won't be enough raw materials but it's only when you come to put these things into practice you realize what all the problems are and the same would count for i don't know uh, moving vehicles to be electric rather than combustion engines 
electricity storage, more solar and wind, and you need to store the excess energy because it's, um, it's intermittent sometimes. So there's a whole world of problems you're getting into. Also, the United Nations says we need to end uh, that constant uh, drive for growth and we need to end consumerism because not only do we have a climate emergency, we've also got a, uh, an ecological emergency, which is where we're destroying the natural world more quickly than it can recover. So there's going to be lots of problems. They all need to be sorted out at the same time. And I've made a list of all the things that governments will need to sort out. So number one, we need to put the economy onto a wartime footing and transition to a zero carbon economy. And that's what the priority be. It won't be your convenience. It won't be, can you still get to work? Does your job even exist anymore? There'll be so many changes, they won't be able to compensate everyone. It will have a drastic effect on the economy, on pensions, on share prices, on the price of your house. They're likely to be rationing to make sure everyone had enough, but no one had too much. Then, there, as well as that, number two, there'd be the increasing costs of dealing with climate change. So, for example, uh, the cost of storms and flooding and things like that. Number three, it'll be more difficult to grow food. Uh, there'll be millions of refugees that will possibly be trying to get into Europe and the United States and other parts of the world. A collapse of consumerism, unreliable food and energy. There's a need to re-industrialise because, as you'll see in a minute, sooner or later, China is at severe risk of losing all of its food supply, or all of its rice production at least. China is likely to try and get the food from anywhere it can in the world, by any means necessary. So either we might be at war with China, or China might no longer be in a position to produce all the, all the goods that we need. So we spent 50 years deindustrializing, moving all of our production across to China and the Far East. Maybe, if, maybe now we need to bring it back. There's eight things that I've written down. Academics warn that a civilization might be able to cope with one problem at a time, but it can't cope with several problems. It makes things much more difficult. And also the second problem that academics are concerned about is all of these things involve spending more money because it's just impossible not to, isn't it? You know, you've got to change the entire human world very quickly. It's going to cost a lot of money. And they would say, well, this is quite normal because all civilizations deal with problems by adding complexity, by adding overhead, at least in the uh, complex civilizations. And it has the effect, which we think as people is a good thing, it has the effect, it keeps our population level. It stops people dying, which, which we, as people in a democracy who vote for the government, we think that's a good thing. We want the government to keep us all alive. But what it means is, as climate change progresses, the environment will be less able to cope with the number of people living in the world. Complex civilizations will keep their populations high, as high as they are now, as long as they can. And then sooner or later, they could no longer support that uh, size of population. And the academics are concerned that leads to a collapse. At the moment, the world's governments say, you can trust us to protect you from climate change because we're going to, or well, we need to halve CO2 emissions by 2030. We need to be carbon neutral by 2050. And then by 2050 onwards, we need to extract large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere. Well, at the moment, we're not going to halve CO2 emissions by 2030. It's unlikely we'll be carbon neutral by 2050, but even if we are, we need the, the technology to extract the large amounts of carbon from the atmosphere called uh, carbon, carbon dioxide removal doesn't exist. They've been trying to make it work, for example, in gas-fired power stations for quite some time. And in a gas-fired power station, about 10% of the fumes coming out of the chimney are CO2. They can't work out a way to do it economically uh, that's viable to do all day every day. They haven't got a way of storing the carbon dioxide that you've, ex that you've extracted reliably and you have to store large amounts all day every day. You see in the news from time to time, uh, test pilot projects and they're all held as great, you know, this is good news. Really, there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere, so much CO2 being emitted that by 2050, we need to have uh, built the carbon dioxide reduction infrastructure all across the world on the same scale as the current uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. 
in 30 years, it doesn't exist at the moment, and the laws of physics and chemistry mean it may never exist. Well, I say that now, I can be quite sure in the comments section, someone will say, you're being pessimistic. Humans have always solved their problems. By 2040, it'll be much more obvious. We've got 10 years to do it, it won't exist. And so, what will governments tell their people then? Will they tell them the truth about how serious things are? Well, the answer is no, and it's for good reason, because a civilization collapses when the relationship between the government and the people breaks down. As soon as the government says there's no hope, um, it's far from clear that will help to improve the situation. <laughs>
our economies in the temperate world, in the global north, have been affected by the collapse of India, the collapse of Africa, flooding in China and the Far East. You know, all of those, a lot of those places I read out that the ship arrived from, from Shenzhen, Kolkata, where was it? North Africa, Turkey, all of these places are going to be really affected by climate change. And you know, our global economy will be in real trouble. At this level of warming, cities also become badly affected. European cities are hotspots for multiple risks of increasing temperatures and extreme heat, floods and droughts. Warming beyond 2 degrees Celsius of global warming is projected to result in widespread impacts on infrastructure and businesses. These include increased risks for energy supply and transport infrastructure, increases in air conditioning needs and high water demand. Do you recognise that from anywhere? We'll run out of water, we'll run out of energy and it'll affect our crops. That's how the scientists write things down. Unless a scientist is 100% sure they can prove it scientifically, a scientist will not write it down. It could be the end of their career. It could undermine public confidence in what the scientists say. As we'll see later on, what scientists say and what they think are not always the same thing. So the weather lady and the, the official UN report are saying the same thing, it seems to me, but they're saying it in slightly different ways. So now we get to some good news because for the first time in their climate report, the United Nations points out the problems of the world being interconnected. Climate risks from outside Europe are emerging due to a combination of the position of European countries in the global supply chain and shared resources. There is emerging evidence that climate risks in Europe may also impact financial markets, food production and marine resources beyond Europe. Although this report is about Europe, the United States is equally well connected to the world. Two degrees Celsius of warming by 2040 not only are we suffering the direct effects of climate change as it affects our food supply, not only are we suffering the effects of having to change our entire human civilization so quickly, if we had to have any hope of survival, but also the economy is less able to pay because the world economy is really suffering due to parts of the world collapsing or being greatly diminished by, by the effects of climate change. It's a perfect storm, isn't it? The problem is, eventually, the economy is no longer able to support the additional costs. And at that point, academics are concerned that civilization collapses. Gone will be the days where people could look to the future, have financial stability, and make long-term investments for long-term growth. The days when you had $250 million to dip the keel of a container ship, who's going to invest in that? So, as well as the short-term impact of climate change, by this time, it's possible that long-term decline will have kicked in. That long-term science and research and financial stability needed for investment will have gone. By this stage, even if we are successfully transitioning to a zero carbon economy, the Earth's systems start to take over and start to add to climate change themselves. Too much of the Amazon rainforest has been destroyed and instead of absorbing the carbon dioxide, now emits it. The same will happen for the great northern forests. Too much of the world's ice sheets will have melted and instead of reflecting the heat back into space, they will allow the oceans to absorb much more of the heat. Large amounts of methane could be emitted from the permafrost that's melting. The oceans, which currently absorb lots of the heat from our global warming, will no longer be able to absorb it and they'll no longer be able to absorb so much CO2. The next decade then is 2050 to 2070. So that'll be the temperature increases between two and a half degrees Celsius and three degrees Celsius. So at 2 degrees Celsius, Europe's cities started to become unlivable, leading to great economic damage. But now the UN is saying it gets worse. Beyond 2.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, possibly by 2050, we will need the relocation of industry, abandonment of farmland, development of alternative livelihoods. Temperature increase will trigger shift of agricultural zones. Under 3 degrees Celsius, significant economic losses in water and energy-dependent sectors. Water scarcity strongly increasing 
for Western, Central and Southern Europe and many cities and this is all under 3 degrees Celsius of warming. Well this is an example I think of how the scientists think one thing but they write down another thing. What I think the scientists are saying here is that by 2050 or 2060, 30 or 40 years time, large parts of Europe will no longer be inhabitable and it's easy to say well you can relocate industry but where is the industry going to relocate and if you are going to relocate it really you need to start going down that process now don't you know to ban new development in the parts of Europe which you think will have water scarcity or will be too hot to be lived in anymore you'll need to move those factories to other parts of Europe where I don't know Europe's quite crowded and also all the people who work in the factories will have to move as well. Abandonment of farmland. Well, as far as I'm aware, there aren't great swathes of unoccupied farmland in Europe that can be taken over. But the scientists don't say that, do they? They don't say there'll be large amounts of Europe that will be uninhabitable and we need a massive migration. Instead, they feel they need to say it in a positive way. You know, don't worry that large parts of Europe will no longer be able to produce food. You can always move to somewhere else and it will be lovely. At this stage, it's quite possible that everyone living in the southern countries of Europe or the southern states of the United States of America will all need to migrate to cooler places that have more water. And even then, it will only be a stopgap, as we'll see in a minute. When we got to 2040, if you thought I was being alarmist by saying the cities will be affected very badly, just like India, you know, running out of energy and water. Well, if you disagree with me, you only have to wait to 2050, possibly 2060, saying we're only arguing about 10 or 20 years before the UN says it's going to happen. And it goes on to say, investments in large water infrastructure and advanced technologies, including storage, water transfer, water recycling and reuse and desalination, allow to buy time and therefore to cope with additional warning. Well, this it seems to me, this is the way scientists write these things down. No scientist has looked at a map of Europe, looked at the forecast and saying, this is how much rain we can expect or strongly believe there'll be or guarantee we'll have this much rain. And therefore you need to build this many reservoirs and you need to build this much irrigation infrastructure. What, they, what they're saying is agriculture and industry and cities in southern and central Europe, central Europe, you know, France, Germany, sort of temperate places, agriculture and cities and industry will no longer be viable in these areas. But no scientist is going to write that down. So what they say is, just spend all this money to, um, to fight water scarcity. And then it don't, even then, they don't say, then we definitely promise that will solve your troubles and you'll be able to carry on. Then they say, it will allow you to buy time and therefore cope with additional warming. Then when you get to 3 degrees Celsius, so when will that be? By 2070, then things get really serious because by that time in Europe, which is a, a mild climate at the moment, we're not really adapted to it. We're maybe spending money insulating our houses, but we're not spending it making sure our houses can cope with 3 degrees Celsius of warming by 2070, so it's 50 years away. We're not building houses with smaller windows, with huge amounts of air conditioning. Because by, 20, by 2070, when we're at three degrees of warming, uh, risks of rutting and blow-ups of roads, particularly in low altitudes, due to high summer temperatures, are expected to increase in Western Central Europe and Eastern Europe. And also, when you get to those sorts of temperatures, the insulation on electrical wiring starts to melt. So, three degrees Celsius, even in Europe, and I'm suggesting other parts of the world, including the United States of America, possibly Canada, Australia, by this time, the tropics will have just gone. You know, if Europe's having this much trouble, how can anyone in the tropics survive? Then we get to our friend of um, cascading and compounding impacts that the United Nations warned us about. High potential to lead to cascading impacts well beyond the water sector since water scarcity affects a number of, of highly interconnected sectors in Europe. Well, like me, I'm very dependent on water, so the whole of Europe really, from agriculture and livestock, farming to energy, hydropower, cooling, industry, 
everything 2070 right now. There's no point in carrying on with the report now. Already the hottest parts of the world are unbearably hot. And even in temperate countries, significant areas have been abandoned and those places where people carry on, there's not enough food, water or factories to build the things that they need. Can you imagine a world like that? Life still carries on, but it seems unlikely there's still a civilization as we might think of it today. Uh, Africa, China, the tropics, possibly parts of the Far East due to flooding uh, are sort of leaving the world economy behind. That will, it won't just all happen at once, it'll be a series of shocks to their world economy as each place goes by uh, little by little. And each time a shock comes, we won't have recovered from the previous shock, remember? One shock can last five years, ten years. The one thing the reports don't cover is how many people will still be left on planet Earth. With the troubles in Africa and India, maybe by the mid-2030s, 10% of the world's population is dead. The, by the 2040s, the tropics will become unbearably hot. By the 2050s, many of the world's low-lying countries in the Far East will have been devastated. Maybe by 2050, there's only half of the world's populations left. But it's impossible to predict because it depends on so much, including how, how the world's governments respond to each catastrophe. And you might be thinking, well, I'm being a bit vague here. Well, I am. It's difficult to look 50 years or 30 years into the future and predict exactly what's going to happen. And especially, you know, the United Nations says our ways of measuring these risks that compound and cascade all across the world is not fit for purpose and that we're in danger because of it. You're thinking, this video is going on a lot. When are we going to get to the end of civilization and what will the end of civilization be like? Well, I'm going to make a third video about the end of civilization because it's much more nuanced than people think. For example, some people say, by the time we run out of food, for example, or there's not enough food to feed everyone, remember, in a complex civilization, we'll have kept our uh, populations high because that's what we like to do in a democracy, keep our people alive. And suddenly we we'll have no food and lots of people and there'll be a great struggle. But there are examples in history where there's been great famine and starvation and society has kept going. For example, in the Second World War, the siege of Leningrad, it lasted over two and a half years. At the beginning of the siege, there were two and a half million people living in the city. By the end of the siege, one million of those had died. Many of them had starved to death. But the authorities managed to keep control. They managed to keep that relationship between the people and the government strong. And they were able to keep going for two and a half years. So you can cope with, you know, even 40% of your population can starve to death in plain sight of everyone else. You can keep civilization going. So it deserves a video by itself, not just those um, bland comments of we won't have enough food and civilization will collapse. But I am going to come up with a date, a prediction, and I'm going to come up with, I think the date civilization will collapse will be, um, it'll be 2053 on the 29th of May, about lunchtime, which mysteriously will be exactly 600 years to the hour of the fall of the Roman Empire. So I'm going 2053. 2070, it seems like inevitable. Some, there'll be no um, world economy, no uh, world civilization, and no modern society as we know it. 2040 is possible, somewhere between 2040 and 2070. 2053, it's as good as guesses anyway. Well, I'm, I'm trying to end the video on a high, but it's quite horrible, isn't it? You know, we start off eight years time, hundreds, maybe 10% of the world's population starve to death in Africa and parts of India and it just gets worse doesn't it how you know how can people sleep at night knowing these things are going to happen and remember I've been reading to you extracts from the United Nations report it's not my own mad idea I'm not being pessimistic I'm reading to you ex excerpts from the United Nations report a report put together by over I think it's probably over 800 scientists all worked together to put it down and also it's a political um, report because the world's governments have to sign up to it. So what you see 
in the official report that I've been reading to you has sort of been toned down a bit. It's had some political pressure, you know, the scientists have been forced to say, do you really mean this? Can we say something a bit less worrying? It's horrible, isn't it? You know, what can, what can anyone do? How can people sleep at night? At this time you are under arrest.